Hello and welcome to Breaking Down Bad Books, a podcast analysing trashy bestsellers from a literary perspective, and today we're looking at chapters 1, 2 and 3 of Insurgent. It's so funny, I was looking forward to doing this book for so long, and now that I'm starting to read it again, I'm like, wait, what? (laughs) Why am I doing this? I don't know. I don't know. But where we left off, we met this chick called Beatrice. And she did an aptitude test, which said she's divergent and that divergence is super rare. And apparently it means that she can fit into one of the five or six, I I forget how many, one of the factions, because in this society, everyone's grouped into little factions based off of a personality trait. Somehow, somehow only one fifth of the population know when they're being lied to, only one fifth know how to read, only one fifth know how to jump off of tall buildings. It's all bullshit. And then she goes to Dauntless. So she, she does the radical thing of changing factions and everyone's like, whoa, what? And her brother does the same thing and everyone's like, whoa, what? And so they all change factions. She starts going through the Dauntless initiation process, which you'd think would be super riveting, but it's a lot of zip lining uh, discussions about hamburgers in the mess hall, a lot of getting tattoos. There is a subplot where someone tries to kill her, but other than that, it's pretty basic. And then lo and behold, erudite, or in the movie, they would call them erudite. They're evil. Big surprise. The smart people are the evil ones. And they have this simulation serum which they're using on the Dauntless people to be their army. And then she interrupts that. She, she stops a little hostile takeover of abnegation. Well, I don't know if she stops it, but she saves like three people and that's a success, even though she sees both of her parents die. Anyway, now she's on the run. They, they took the hard drive with the simulation data on it, whatever the hell that means. And they're on the run. They're going to Amity, who are the nice people, the Hufflepuffs, if you will. I think we're all up to speed. So let's get through it. So we have an epigraph. And it says, like a wild animal, the truth is too powerful to remain caged. And I was like, oh, is that Maya Angelou? That sounds like Maya Angelou. No, it's from the Candor Faction Manifesto. So now she's not even pulling shit from other books. She can't even think of a proper literary reference. So she's like, I'll just make it up and say it's from the Candor Faction Manifesto. I'm sorry, that's not a real thing. You can't do epigraphs for, for, for things that aren't real. Oh, God. And then we start chapter one and she says, I wake with his name in my mouth, Will. She's picturing him crumpled to the pavement dead. Because remember, she shot her best friend, Will. Maybe not best friend, but he was certainly in her close circle of friends. She shot him and she's waking up. She's still on the train with Tobias, Marcus, Peter and Caleb. They're fleeing Dauntless and they're heading towards Amity. I know she said, I wake with his name in my mouth, but I don't actually think she said it out loud. Because then it just says Will in italics, not in a quote mark. And then none of the other characters on the train are like, sorry, did you say something? So I guess she woke up with his name in her mouth, but she didn't verbalize it outside of her mouth. Uh, Unclear. And what's that song like? I woke up with your name on my lips. I woke up with your lips on my imagination. What is that song? I love that song. So she's waking up on the train. She's singing Jack, Jack, Jackie. And apparently they need to get off because they're heading towards their stop. And Tobias is like, we have to jump. Remember, the train doesn't stop, except they're heading towards the end of the fence line because the Amity, they live like just within the fence line and they farm outside of the fence line. So what's the train going to do? Is it going to go through the fence? uh, What's happening here? I know the train stops. Last time you guys went there on the field trip to the fence, it stops. I'm going to try and not get hung up on the train, not stopping thing, but it's going to take a lot of strength. So they jump off the train, they land. Tris takes a bit of a hard fall because she was shot in the shoulder not too long ago, like that day. And so she's a bit like, ouch, that hurt. That fall really took it out of me. And so then Marcus is like, wait a minute, where are all the dauntless guards? They're meant to be here. And Tobias is like, 
dude, they were probably under the simulation. And so now who knows what the hell they're doing? But Tobias, he's thrifty. He's thrifty, he's nifty, he knows things because he he did an internship in the security room at Dauntless or something. And that's why he apparently has all this knowledge. And so he goes up to the gate and he approaches a small metal box and it reveals a keypad. And he says, well, let's hope the erudite, see now I'm saying erudite because of the stupid movie. Let's hope the erudite didn't think to change the combination. (laughs) So he knows the combination to the gate. And Caleb, Triss's brother, he says, how do you know the combination? And he says, I worked in the Dauntless control room monitoring the security system. We only change the codes twice a year. What? Why would you only change the codes twice a year? Why have a code at all if you're never going to change it? I don't You're telling me we have this giant fence, this giant fuck off fence, and we're locking people inside. We're saying there's monsters or some shit on the outside and we're only changing the code twice a year? Twice a year? And it's the area diet that changed the combination? Why would you outsource the thinking up of a code to area diet? Like, I'm sure you could have handled that on your own, Dauntless. I know you're not the smarties, but you could have come up with a four digit code or or at least a six digit. Maybe you're chucking in some letters and a symbol. Although, yeah, you know what? Passwords are hard these days. Maybe that's why they've outsourced because... My work computer, ugh, it's so freaking annoying. It'll always be like, you need to update a new password. And I'm like, fine. And it'll be like, oh, that's too similar to your old one. And I'm like, okay. And then it's like, oh, that's a word that exists in the dictionary. And I'm like, yeah, it's a, f- yeah, yeah, it is. But I'm not allowed to do that. And then they're like, oh, have a symbol. Oh, have, have a fucking capitalization. And I'm like, can you let me live? How, how am I meant to remember this password? So yeah, I, whew, here I was making fun of the, Dauntless for only changing it twice a year, but I get it. Upon reflection, I get it. Remembering things is very hard, especially with all the complexities that you have to have these days. Anyway, so Caleb's like, well, that was lucky that you worked in the security room, even though I'm pretty sure Tobias worked there for, yeah, like five days and then he started becoming an instructor. It's all very coincidental, but Tobias says, luck has nothing to do with it. I only worked there because I wanted to make sure that I could get out. And Tris shivers. She says, oh, the way he talks about getting out, it's like he thinks we're trapped. I never thought about it that way before. And now that seems foolish. Actually, Tris, yes, you have thought about it that way before, because I remember last book when you went on that field trip to the fence, you were like, huh, how about that? The locks on the outside, almost as if we're being locked in. So you did ruminate on it, but now she's like, I've never thought about that before. Yes, you have. Did Veronica forget? So they're walking towards the Hufflepuff headquarters. And apparently there's a cluster of wooden and glass buildings, but to get there, they have to walk through an orchard because, you know, Hufflepuffs, they like herbology. They're into that whole sort of thing. And apparently Marcus knows where to go. So he leads the way and he just opens up one of the doors and they're in and they're in. And she says, I would be shocked by the lack of security if we were not at Amity headquarters. They often straddle the line between trust and stupidity. The lack of security, didn't, didn't Ford just do something on a keypad. You could only get there because he, he knew the code to get over the fence. uh, Lack of security. And so Marcus stops before a room with Joanna Reyes in it. So she's Amity's representative. And it's hard to forget Joanna's face. She tells us because a scar stretches in a thick line from just above her right eyebrow to her lip, rendering her blind in one eye and giving her a lisp when she talks. And Tris says, she would have been a beautiful woman if not for that scar. So here we go again with the Stephanie Meyer-esque descriptions of disfigured women not being beautiful because of their scarring. What? Why is this a trend? This is a YA trend. And so Joanna's like, oh, there you are. We were wondering when you would get here because she's already given a safe house to the abnegation people who did escape. And she says, I'll get a doctor. I can grant you all permission to stay for the night, but tomorrow our community must decide together. And they're not gonna like having this dauntless presence in our compound. And she says, I have to, of course, ask you to turn over any weapons that you might have. And Tris wonders, she says, I wonder suddenly how she knows that I am dauntless. She says, I'm still wearing my gray shirt, my father's gray shirt. How can 
can she possibly tell that I'm jawless? Maybe because you're jacked. Maybe because you have tattoos. Maybe because you have blood all over you. Maybe because the people who arrived before you said something. Maybe she saw you at the choosing ceremony because you are one of the abnegation leaders, one of the government leaders' daughters. Maybe she saw you defect to a different faction and she said, huh, I'll take note of that. But she, oh, how does she know? How does the gray shirt not fool her? She says, Tobias hands over his gun. But when I reach behind me to take out my own concealed weapon, he grabs my hand, guiding it away from my back. Then he laces his fingers with mine to cover up what he just did. So it's kind of lucky for them that Joanne is half blind because, I mean, how did they get away with that? She says, hand over your weapons. And Triss is like, okay. And she starts reaching behind her back. And then Tobias is like fiddling with her hand, shoving her hand away and then pretending to hold her hand like, hello, Captain Obvious Twins. But half blind Joanna, she doesn't clock it. And so then (laughs) Joanna says, hi, my name is Joanna. (laughs) And she extends her hand towards the two of them, you know, in a handshake. Now you'll remember, handshakes, they're very contentious things in these books. And she says, oh my gosh, a dauntless greeting. I am impressed by her awareness of the customs of other factions. Well, yet she's like the leader of Amity. Of course, she's going to know how to shake a hand. And I know last book she said, oh, the abnegation, we never touch hands. We never handhold, we never shake hands. It's crazy to me how these dauntless people are shaking hands. Apparently it's just the dauntless that shake hands. That's a specific thing to just them. How does that track? So Marcus starts introducing everyone and he says, oh, this is to, and then four cuts him off and he says, my name is four. So yeah, he doesn't like going by Tobias. And she says, a few days ago, Tobias was a name only I knew among the Dauntless. It was a piece of himself that he gave to me. Yeah, only you knew it. And the whole rest of his class that knew his name before he said he was going to be called Four at the end of his graduation. Just, you know, except all of those multitudes of people. You're the only person that knows his name is Tobias. Okay. And then Joanna says, welcome to the Amity Compound. And her eyes fix on Triss's face and she smiles crookedly. Okay, well, I, I, I hate to say it, but yes, she is going to smile crookedly all the time if she's got a giant scar running from her eyebrow to her lip. And she said both eyes are on her face. Eyes. I don't, I don't know if that's accurate either. It's like Veronica's just giving her these descriptors. She's giving her these facial characteristics and then forgetting about them. And she's like, oh, she's got a crooked smile. But she's always got a crooked smile. So they go, they have some dinner. Some of them go to the hospital ward. Someone slips her like a sleeping draft. And the person says, drink this. It will help you sleep as it has helped some of the others sleep. No dreams. And she says it's a liquid that is pink red like strawberries. And she grabs the cup and she drinks it fast. Has she learned nothing? Every time she's been given some sort of liquid by someone, she ends up going into a fear scape or getting her brain chemistry altered. And here she is just like, yeah, all right. Strawberry surprise, knocking it back. And she's calling them gullible and stupid. Ugh. She says, I feel myself relaxing. Someone leads me down the hallway to a room with a bed in it. That is all. And that's the end of the chapter. That is all. Like she's dismissing us like she's Miranda Priestley from The Devil Wears Prada. That's all. Union, which exposed the exploit. That's all. That's all. That's all. That's all. That's all. That's all. And so that's the end of chapter one. And then we start with chapter two. She's waking up. She's terrified. Her hands are clutching at the sheets. Not sure if she has Will's name in her mouth. Then she realizes she's in bed in the Amity headquarters. And she says, I shift and wince as something digs into my back. I reach behind me and my fingers wrap around the gun. So she's sleeping on top of a gun. I don't think that's very safe. Like, I know you can have a safety on a gun, but I still don't think you should sleep on top of it. And then she has a flash of Will standing before her and she thinks, his hand. I could have shot his hand. Why didn't I shoot his hand? And I'm like, yeah, now you're realizing that you're a murderer. But okay, so we're going to have this guilt about Will for the whole book, I suspect, which, okay, it's kind of fair enough. 
Also, both of her parents died sacrificing themselves for her, which would be more of a big deal if they didn't value sacrifice so much. So I guess they're happy. It's a happy ending for her parents. But I would still be a bit sad, perhaps. She's not really indicating much sadness, but uh, it, it might come. It might come. So she gets up and then she lifts up the mattress and then puts the gun underneath the mattress to hide it, which is kind of probably what she should have done last night, but she took a sleeping pill. Oh, sorry, sleeping strawberry liquid. And so then Tobias knocks and he comes in and he's wearing the same jeans as yesterday, but a dark red t-shirt instead of his black one. And she says, probably borrowed from one of the Amity. Yes, of, of course it is. Yellow and red are the Amity colors. He, he doesn't own a red shirt. You, you saw him come to the Amity compound with nothing but the shirt on his back. So yeah, oh, probably, probably borrowed from one of the Amity. Probably. Yeah, we know you don't have to spell everything out for us. And he says the Amity are meeting in half an hour to decide our fate. And she's like, ugh, never thought my fate would be in the hands of a bunch of Amity. And he's like, ugh, me either. So, okay, we're just sledging the Hufflepuffs here, aren't we? Like, be nice. At least they didn't try and kill you straight away like the Erudite did. And so he says, how are you, Beatrice? And she's like, well, why are you calling me Beatrice? And he's like, I don't know, I thought I'd give it a try. And she says, well, maybe on special occasions only, like initiation days, choosing days. And then she says, oh, I was about to rattle off a few more holidays, but only the abnegation celebrate them. The Dauntless have holidays of their own, I assume, but I don't know what they are. How does she not know the holidays? You've been a Dauntless for weeks and weeks and it never came up. You didn't learn any of this in faction history? She knows more about Amity than she does about Dauntless. She's assuming they have holidays. Why didn't you ever ask anybody? If I was a new recruit to a faction, I'd be like, oh, hey, how's your initiation ceremony going? Do we have a timetable of public holidays? I'd be like meeting people being like, hey, that's great. When's Christmas? Also, can you really say you've been initiated if you haven't even been given the basics about what you celebrate and don't celebrate? But she knows how to throw a knife. Oh, she knows how to play paintball while capturing flags. Like, oh. And so then he says, okay, well, how are you, Tris? And she's like, um, I don't, I don't really know. And she hasn't told him about Will yet. And she's like, I don't know if I really want him to know. I don't know how I'm going to tell him that I shot that guy in the head instead of shooting him in the hand. And she gets out like three words. She says, I don't know for I'm awake. I dot, dot, dot. And then he just starts kissing her. So he's like, yeah, I don't give a shit. And so they start making out and he's like, yeah, sorry. I shouldn't have asked because I guess he's remembered that her parents just died yesterday, both of them. She's now an orphan. And so he's probably like, you know what? Probably wasn't tactful of me to make out with you just then, but whatever. And she's like, oh, he probably does sympathize because he also lost his mother when he was young. I don't remember how she died, just that we attended her funeral. She attended his mum's funeral. Suddenly I remember him clutching the curtains in his living room about nine years old, wearing gray, his dark eyes shut. The image is fleeting and it could be my imagination, not a memory. Well, I hope it's not a memory because you certainly forgot that he ever existed for the first half of last book. Are we retconning? Is this a retcon that they knew each other all along? What's going on here? So then she walks down to the women's bathroom, which is two doors down. And apparently there's a sign saying to conserve resources, showers run for only five minutes and they're cold showers. And she's like, oh, fuck this. And then she says, when I get out of the shower, a stack of clothes wait on my bed. So I I think she walked naked back to her bedroom, which was two doors down the hallway. She's just strutting around the Amity compound with her tartars out, just living free and large, isn't she? So she's getting dressed. She's wearing abnegation red and yellow as well as some gray. So she's a bit of a mishmash, which I think is a metaphor for her being divergent. (laughs) Who knows? I don't think Amity was one of the factions that she was ever actually predisposed to because she doesn't seem that kind, but it could be a metaphor for her being divergent. And so then someone knocks on the door and it's Susan. Remember Susan? She used to be abnegation as well. They used to live next door and she thought that Susan was going to hook up with Caleb. I think that's who Susan was. So Susan's knocking on the door and she's like, sorry, the clothes don't fit that great, but what are you going to do? And Susan says, I heard you were shot. 
Do you need my help with your hair or your shoes? Uh, maybe she needs a little bit more than help with her hair and putting on shoes if she's been shot in the shoulder, Susan. Maybe she needs a transfusion. Maybe she needs more bandages. I don't think she needs her hair done up in a braid. But Tris says, yeah, you know what? Yeah, could you braid my hair? That'd be great. And so then she makes poor Susan braid her hair. And while she's being a little servant girl, Tris starts making small talk and she says, oh, have you run into your brother Robert yet? Because he chose Amity, whereas Susan's stuck with abnegation. You know how... Pretty much 90% of the people changed factions, even though we were led to believe that that would be a rare occurrence. So yeah, he's one of the ones that also switched. And she says, yeah, I briefly saw him last night, but I left him to grieve with his faction and I grieve with mine. It's nice to see him again though. So she's just like, yeah, he's dead to me. And Susan says, it's a shame this happened when it did. Our leaders were about to do something wonderful, which is a bit of a new nugget of information. And Triss is like, really? What? And Susan's like, I don't know. I just knew something was going to happen. I just, you know, I noticed things. I didn't mean to be curious because abnegation aren't allowed to be curious. But Susan picked up on something. So who knows what she's talking about? So poor Susan does up her hair in a braid. And so then she excuses herself and then Triss is just looking in the mirror and then she's like, hmm, actually, I don't like the braid. And so she sees a sewing kit and she picks up a pair of scissors and she says, I feel calm as I undo the braid in my hair and comb it again. And then she chops off half her hair. Poor Susan, you just wasted her time making her braid your hair and now you're chopping it off. Like even if you did just comb it out, It'd still be offensive. It'd still be a waste of time, but then you chopped it off. She could have chopped it off for you. Why are you wasting Susan's time? And I think what she's doing is she recognized that she looks like her mother or some bullshit. So she chopped her hair so she doesn't look like a mum, So she's not reminded of a mum or something like that. And then she leaves the room without looking at her reflection. So what's the the point of chopping your hair to change how you look if you're not going to look at yourself? But whatever. And so then she walks out, she joins up with the boys and Caleb, he says, you cut your hair. And she says, grabbing hold of facts in the midst of shock is very erudite of him. Now I hope that's a joke. I hope this is some sort of dry humor because he just noticed that you chopped off half your hair. I don't think you have to be erudite to notice that. And then she says his hair sticks up on one side from where he slept on it and his eyes are bloodshot. Okay. Does it make you erudite to notice that? Uh, She must have been trying to crack a funny with us. uh, She must have. Because if she's actually applauding him for grabbing hold of facts, then then I can't even. So then she goes outside and she says, the outside air presses around me like a pillow meant to suffocate me. I, I don't think that's how air works. And she says, it smells green the way a leaf does when you tear it in half. I don't think green's a smell. I don't smell colors. I don't know about you. The only color that I can smell is that pink hand soap that you get in like public restrooms. You know that hand soap? It's that liquid pink and it smells, it smells like pink. There there really is no other way to describe it, but that's the only color I can smell. I don't think green has a smell. And so Caleb and Tobias, they have a little interaction. Caleb's like, oh, does everyone know that you're Marcus's son? And he's like, ah, no, please don't mention it. And Caleb's like, all right, whatever. How old are you anyway? And he says, 18. And he says, and you don't think you're a little too old to be with my little sister? And so then Triss is like, oh, boys, cut it out. Stop it. So all the Hufflepuffs are meeting in a circular greenhouse. They're all wearing yellow and they're sitting amongst the trees. And in the center of them, there's this like huge tree. Like it's, it's just ridiculously huge and its roots bubble up from the ground. And in the space between the roots, there's actually metal rods holding the roots in place. So the Amity have like rigged up this whole thing to keep the tree intact using erudite technology, she assumes. And then standing on the cluster of roots is Joanna. Oh, and her hair is falling over the scarred half of her face. So just That's just your update on her scarred, disfigured face, because I feel like we're going to get that description every single time she's mentioned. She says, I learned in faction history that the Amity recognized no official leader. They vote on everything and the result is usually close to unanimous. They are like many parts of a single mind and Joanna is their mouthpiece. So she can learn that in faction history, but she can't learn about the dauntless public holidays. Whatever. 
And so, yeah, all the Amity are sitting on their floor with their legs crossed in like a circle. And this is giving me Entmoot vibes from Lord of the Rings. You know when Merry and Pippin are like, hey, Ents, you should probably go to war against Isengard. And then they just sit around talking for hours and hours and days and days, not making a decision. And then Merry's like, so what's going on? And he's like, oh, we've just finished saying good morning. And it's like nighttime. That's what I'm getting here. Because Joanna starts addressing them and she says, we have before us today an urgent question, which is how we will conduct ourselves in this time of conflict as a people who pursue peace. And so they're all just chattering, just talking amongst themselves, conferring. And Triss is like, how do they get anything done? And Tobias says, they don't care about efficiency. They care about agreement. So they're ants. They're ants. And then Four explains that they each have an equal role in government. They each feel equally responsible and it makes them care. It makes them kind. And he thinks that's beautiful. And she's like, that's not sustainable. (laughs) Sure, it works for the Amity. But what happens when not everyone wants to strum banjos and grow crops? Yeah, I, oh, I'm on your side here, Tris. I don't know if Veronica's trying to do a smart thing here where each of the different factions has a different sort of government structure to comment on which is more effective than the other. I don't know if that's what she's going for, but I'm getting like commie vibes from the Amity and the Dauntless. They're sort of like Spartan where like the greatest warriors they lead and then abnegation's like more of the democracy type thing. Oh, I don't know. The abnegation seem a bit Marxist as well. I might have to uh, pay more attention to this, but I think she's doing something with the different types of government structures. Who knows? Anyway, what I'm trying to say is the Amity, they're Ents. They're Hufflepuffy and Ents. And so after hours of deliberation, Joanna, she says, our faction has had a close relationship with Erudite for as long as any of us can remember. We need each other to survive and we have always cooperated with each other. But we've also had a strong relationship with abnegation in the past and we do not think it is right to revoke the hand of friendship when it has for so long been extended. So she's saying bullshit fucking all like get a backbone amity erudite just murdered all of abnegation and you're like yeah you know what we've had a close relationship for as long as we can remember you know what relationships can end i don't think you should be supporting the erudite in this and by not doing anything seems like you're supporting them but whatever she says we feel that the only way to preserve our relationships with both factions is to remain impartial and uninvolved okay well (laughs) Maintain a relationship with both factions. Abnegation doesn't exist anymore because they're all dead. Erudite killed them all, except for like the six refugees you have in your camp at the moment. And she says, but you know what? It's kind of hard to be not involved and impartial when you guys are living here. And it's like, well, yeah, no fucking shit. And then she says, we have arrived at the conclusion that we will establish our faction headquarters as a safe house for members of all factions. (laughs) But there'll be conditions. The first, that there's no weapons allowed. The second is that if any serious conflict arises, whether verbal or physical, all involved parties will be asked to leave. And the third is that the conflict may not be discussed, even privately within the confines of the compound. Okay, that's ridiculous. How are you going to police that? And the fourth is that everyone who stays must contribute to the welfare of the environment by working, blah, blah, fucking blah. And also, I think that second condition, all involved parties will be asked to leave if there's a conflict. Pretty freaking rough. Like, none of that he started it, she started it stuff. You're both out. Pretty hard lined. And Tris, she's already broken the rules by having a gun, but she's like, oh God, this isn't going to last long. And I agree, it's probably not going to last long. And she says, we won't be able to stay long to Tobias under her breath. And he says, uh, you think? And that's the end of that chapter. And so we go to chapter three. It's that evening. She's in her room and she's checking that the gun's still there. So she's breaking the rules. And then she touches the gun and she starts to have a bit of a panic attack. I think over the whole will thing. And she can't breathe. She says she feels like she's having an allergic reaction. And then she looks out her window And she sees Joanna and Marcus walking side by side, going through the herb garden, picking mint leaves from their stems. So she has got eagle vision to see all that out of her bedroom window in the evening. And without a moment's thought, she's out of the room to try and track them. So panic attack over. 
And so she sees Marcus and Joanna disappear into a row of trees. And so she's hiding behind some branches watching. And I guess she can hear them as well because we get all the dialogue. And Joanna's saying, I've been confused about the timing of the attack. Is it just that Janine finally finished planning it and acted? Or was there some sort of inciting incident? And she's peeking through a divided tree trunk, but she can see Marcus's face pinched together. And Joanna says, well, I guess we'll never know. And listen to this. Joanna raises her good eyebrow. Will we? Like, do we need to know that it's her good eyebrow? Can you let the bitch with the disfigured face just have a little bit of grace? And Joanna's pressing Marcus and she says, you do know. You know why she attacked when she did. I may not be candor anymore, but I can still tell when someone is keeping the truth from me. Okay, so she's another faction defector. Does anyone stay in the faction that they're born with apart from poor Susan? And so then Marcus is saying, there's a reason you don't know all the things I know. A long time ago, the abnegation were entrusted with some sensitive information. Janine attacked us to steal it. And if I am not careful, she will destroy it. So that is all I can tell you. So not too sure what that's all about. Probably the fact that their whole existence is a ruse and that they're being locked in as some sort of experiment, probably. And Joanna's like, so what are you talking about? And Marcus is like, nah, this information, it's far more important than you can imagine. Most of the leaders of the city risked their lives to protect it from Janine and died. And I will not jeopardize it now for the sake of your curiosity. Then Marcus, why'd you bring it up? She didn't really ask anything. Like she didn't say, oh, what secrets do you know? You said, by the way, there's this big, juicy, juicy bit of information. I'm sitting on this biggest secret. Oh, it'll blow your mind to hear it, but I'm not going to be able to tell you. And she just said, oh, oh, really? Like, what, what is it? And he's like, no, no, stop asking me. And so then Joanna's quiet for a few seconds and get this. She says, it's so dark now, I can barely see my own hands. So she can barely see her own hands in front of her. Okay, remember this. It's that dark. And Joanna says, I'm sorry, I must have done something to make you believe I'm not trustworthy. And he says, the last time I trusted a faction representative with this information, all my friends were murdered. I don't trust anyone anymore. Okay, so, so you did trust Janine with the information? I thought you just said you didn't tell her anything and she tried to kill people for that information. But now you're saying the last time I trusted someone with that information, everyone was murdered. So I don't know. I don't know. Who knows what Janine knows? And so then she's leaning forward a bit to lean around the trunk of the tree to see what they're doing. And she says, they're close together, but not touching. I've never seen Marcus look so tired or Joanna so angry, but her face softens as she touches Marcus's arm again, this time with a light caress. How can she see any of that? She couldn't even see her own hands in front of her, but she can see that fucker's face soften. She can see him looking tired and her looking angry. Also, I've never seen Marcus look so tired or Joanna so angry. Of course you haven't seen Joanna so angry. You met her today. Like you might've seen her once before floating around a choosing ceremony, but you really didn't see much of her. And she's like, oh, I've never seen her that angry. Oh, she's so angry. You don't really have much of an awareness of how angry she can get, but now she can recognize everything. She can see that whole interaction, even though she couldn't even see her hands in the dark. This is bullshit. And then she says to him, oh, I hope you change your mind. I've always been your friend even when you didn't have many to speak of. And then she leans in and kisses his cheek and then walks to the end of the orchard. So she can see that. She can see her walking to the end of the orchard. And then Marcus stands there for a few seconds, apparently stunned. And then he heads towards the compound. So she sees the whole thing. And so now she's thinking, whoa, I thought Janine attacked abnegation to seize power, but she wanted information. And then she's thinking, oh, was my father one of the leaders who sacrificed themselves for this information? I have to find out what could possibly be important enough for the abnegation to die for and the erudite to kill for. And so then she goes up to Tobias's room, but before knocking, she just starts eavesdropping. (laughs) And Tobias is having some sort of argument with Caleb, who cares? And she opens the door. She doesn't knock. She doesn't end up knocking. She just barges right on in and... Tobias and Caleb are throwing knives. Tobias is like teaching him how to throw a knife. And Caleb's blown away. He's like, whoa, how can you throw a knife into a hunk of cheese on top of a dresser? He's, his mind is blown. And she's like, okay, what are you guys doing here? What's all this tomfoolery? 
And Tobias says, oh, Caleb came by to discuss something and then we just started throwing knives, you know, as boys do. And so then there's just this sexual chemistry between Four and Triss and they're just staring at each other intensely. No one's saying anything. And then Caleb's like, okay, uh, I better get back to my room. I'll leave you guys to it. And then he says, I'm reading this book about water filtration systems. It's so fascinating, blah, blah, fucking blah. And Triss is like, don't give a shit, bro. And she says, once he's left, she's like, what was that all about? And he says, I think it was the big brother talk. Don't mess around with my sister and all that. And she's like, okay, well, what'd you tell him? And he said, I told him that we're together and I'm not messing around. And then they start making out and it's getting hot and heavy. She says, his breaths, my breaths, his body, my body. We are so close. There is no difference. So in my mind, they're dry humping. And mm, again, her parents just died. She just killed a best friend. Um, not sure if it's appropriate to be dry humping so soon, but we all grieve in different ways, don't we? And he pulls back a bit because he's probably thinking this is probably a bit inappropriate. So he pulls back and he says, this isn't what you came here for. And she's like, no. And he says, well, what'd you come here for then? And she says, who cares? And then she pulls him in closer for more kissing. And again, he's probably feeling a bit uncomfortable. So he pulls away and he's like, Tris, come on. And she goes, okay, okay. I did actually come here to tell you something important. And so she tells him about the conversation she eavesdropped on between disfigured Joanna and child abuser Marcus. And so when she's finished, Tobias says, I think that's Marcus trying to feel more important than he is. And she's like, what? You think he's bullshitting? And he says, I think there probably is some information that the abnegation knew that Janine wanted to know, but I think he's exaggerating its importance, just trying to build up his own ego by making Joanna think he's got something she wants and he wants to give to her. And she says, "Mm, I don't think so. I don't think you're right. It didn't sound like he was lying. Oh, so she's candor now. (sighs) And Tobias says, um, that's my dad. You don't know him like I do. He's actually an excellent liar. Well, I I mean, if he was lying, Joanna should have picked up on it because she was in candor until the age of like 16. And she says, he's right. I don't know Marcus and certainly not as well as he does. But my instinct was to believe Marcus and I usually trust my instincts. (sighs) This is coming from the character that tossed and turned for a whole book about whether she was actually dauntless or abnegation or a mix of both. She did not have an instinct to grasp onto. Oh, just a whole book of to, to and fro and, but now she's like, oh, I actually trust my gut at all times. Sure you do, Tris, sure you do. And Tobias says, well, you know what? Let's put a pin in that. Let's go back to the city, find out what's going on, find a way to take the erudite down. Then maybe we can find out what Marcus was talking about after all this is resolved, which I think is a bit simplistic. Like, obviously it's part of it. Clearly they want some sort of knowledge, but oh, all right, great plan. And she nods, she says, it sounds like a good plan, a smart plan. It's not a plan. He, his plan was go back to the city, find out what's going on, find a way to take erudite down and then figure it out later. Like, that's not, that's not a plan. That's like a vague outline. Go to the city, take down Erudite. Like, oh, oh, it's a two-step plan. But she does have her reservations. And she's like, it's difficult to persuade Tobias to do something he doesn't want to do. But it's even more difficult to justify my feelings with no evidence except my intuition. So I agree, but I don't change my mind. And that's the end of the chapter. So we're back in Divergent Land. How do you guys feel? Are you happy to be hanging out with the Hufflepuffs? Let me know. And I'll see you guys next week for the next few chapters. Bye. Send your burning thoughts, frustrations, and grievances on this latest chapter of this shitty book to breakingdownpod at gmail.com or on Twitter at podbreakingdown and Instagram at breakingdownbadbooks. You can visit www.breakingdownbadbooks.com for all the listen links, contact information, merch, and more. To support the show on Patreon and gain access to exclusive ad-free bonus episodes, visit patreon.com slash breakingdownbadbooks. Ratings and reviews on your preferred podcast platform are also a fun, free way to support the show. Breaking Down Bad Books is hosted by me, Nathan Brown, who you can follow on Instagram and Twitter at NathanBrown90. Thanks for listening and happy reading.